We have uh, two speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. Dimitrios Stephanidis. Uh, Dr. Stephanidis is a professor of surgery, the vice chair of education, the chief of minimally invasive and bariatric surgery in the Department of Surgery at Indiana University. training and optimizing surgical performance. He has published over 180 peer review paper and several book chapters. Dr. Danny Yu is currently an assistant professor of the industrial engineering at Purdue University. He's a certified professional agronomist and an adjunct assistant professor of surgery at Indiana University School of Medicine. His current research links the areas of ergonomics, exposure, work and intervention design, and a systems engineering with application in improving the safety in the healthcare world environment for both patients and medical professionals. Um, please welcome Dr. Dimitrios Stefanidis. He's going to be the first speaker. Dr. Steph Stefanidis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so greatly appreciate the opportunity by NIOSH to present um, this morning um, the work we've done uh, with uh, Dr. Yu's team yeah. around ergonomics and surgery. And um, I will start by addressing the rationale for our research. Um, so a lot of this uh, had to do with the fact that uh, there is emerging literature suggesting um, surgeon ergonomic risk is a really highly prevalent uh, problem in, in our practice. And um, a lot of it was also driven by my own experience with ergonomic injuries and realizing that um, there may be something that we need to, that we can do better and that we need to look at it a little more in depth. So as a background, um, there's a, at this point a number of uh, systematic reviews as well as obviously literature they are based on that demonstrate that um, uh, the prevalence of um, ergonomic risk for surgeons. So in, in a systematic review published in 2018 that surveyed essentially that looked at 6,100 uh, uh, surgeons uh, from uh, 40 articles, um, they assessed um, reported pain uh, related to surgery. And um, you can see in the graph uh, that um, it's fairly prevalent, so about half of people report back pain, neck pain, um, shoulder pain, and then um, a little lower percentage report um, eye pain, hand pain, and leg pain. Um, importantly, op uh, they also report that the operating exacerbated the pain in 60% or so, but um, at the same time, only about 30% uh, sought treatment for the symptoms. And this uh, probably has directly to do with the fact that uh, uh, surgeons generally feel, uh, are trained to just um, uh, move through pain and move through whatever they, they're experiencing to just take care of patients. So the impact on uh, uh, quality of life has been also reported by a different study in 2017. And you can see that 80% um, report pain or discomfort that lasts uh, less than 24 hours, while about half of them report pain or discomfort that interferes with their sleep, and about 40% um, uh, find that or report that uh, the pain and the discomfort affects their relationships. Uh, the pie graph uh, you are seeing in the screen just uh, refers to the different types of um, uh, functions, daily functions, uh, that are affected by uh, the pain and uh, the discomfort uh, that the surgeons experience as a result of surgery. Um, and that their posture can be affected, balance, concentration, one of the most prevalent uh, things is the posture, obviously. But uh, you can see all the factors that uh, have been described. Another important thing to recognize is that, um, uh, and that has been brought up by different systematic reviews, that um, the symptoms that patients experience vary uh, by the type of surgery. And um, for those of you who are not very familiar with, uh, uh, we can break surgery in a number of different uh, distinct buckets. Uh, open surgery, like when we create big incisions, we use our hands in the patient. 
uh, laparoscopic surgery, small incisions uh, using laparoscopic instruments, robotic surgery where we, it's similar to laparoscopy, but we don't really manipulate the instruments uh, per se, just uh, they ha that manipulation happens through the robot uh, that uh, is an extension of our hands. And, and some other uh, uh, subcategories, but those, uh, for the, this presentation, I'll ref, refer mostly to these three. And you can see in this uh, forest plot on, to the right that um, um, when you look, when um, uh, these investigators looked at laparoscopy versus open surgery, the odds ratio was a lot higher for most um, aspects of uh, symptoms uh, for laparoscopy. And so more back pain, neck pain, um, shoulder pain, hand pain, uh, etc. So. <coughs> Another study actually looked at the risk factors that account for, for the ergonomic uh, injuries that the work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, so for open surgery, they found that uh, this is the case in about 66-94% of reported uh, studies. And the risk factors have to do with uh, using loops or headlamps and uh, microscopes. Um, those are probably related to the fact that when you use those, uh, you, have, you, you assume specific positions that may not be ergonomically sound. Laparoscopy, on the other hand, 73 to 100 percent of uh, reports suggest that um, uh, these injuries happen, and um, they have to do with the table and monitor position. When they're off, uh, there's always neck uh, issues, um, uh, long shafted instruments that happen to be used in poor instrument handle design. Um, I can tell you that I have multiple calluses in my hand set me doing laparoscopy for the better for the last 15 years, uh, just because the instruments are just very rudimentary and you have to, um, instead of the instrument be designed to um, fit in your hand, your hand has to fit in the instrument. Uh, vaginal surgery, this, uh, this uh, particular um, review was done by gynecologists, so they had an interest in this. Uh, also highly prevalent uh, uh, injuries and then um, they attributed them as risk factors for to improper table height and twisted trunk position. And for robotic assist, assisted surgery, perhaps the percentage is a little less than for the other types, but still uh, prominent and prevalent, and they had to do with associated, were associated with trunk, wrist, and finger strain. Uh, so we, we use our, our fingers to manipulate the instruments, and obviously, there's also a lot of wrist manipul uh, movement during robotic surgery, and that uh, uh, puts those um, joints at risk. So there's some mitigation strategies that a number of uh, surgeons use um, to um, feel better, I guess, or to perhaps minimize some of the discomfort they feel in the surgery. And they typically include changing positions in about 60% of the cases, or taking breaks within the sterile field about 35% uh, uh, or adjusting the equipment. So there are four common postural tendencies that have been described in the literature for surgeons. And um, uh, essentially, it's the body's uh, tendency to adjust to the demands of the job. And um, the most common postures for surgeons are actually the sway back and the kyphotic lordotic. As you can see the image number two and image number four um, uh, in this one. Uh, we actually uh, have done a number of studies, as I mentioned, uh, and um, this schematic um, here, we had one of our own people draw which essentially shows the observations that uh, some of our investigators made. And uh, they show that the sway back position that um, uh, surgeons actually uh, assume, at least in our own experience, actually worsens with time. And, and if, if, you, if you look at um, the um, uh, sequence of these images, uh, the more experienced the surgeon is, the more sway back the position tends to become. You also see that for, uh, on the left side of the screen that uh, the right shoulder tends to be uh, lower than the left, and this uh, reflects actually right-handed surgeons, um, also uh, showing the demands uh, on our posture of, the, of, the, of what the job really requires. So. Some of the aims that we've uh, had, uh, as we're 
we've been trying to get a better understanding of ergonomics and surgery and what we can do about this um, had to do with uh, characterizing the demands of uh, minimum invasive surgery in, in, uh, on, uh, on the surgeon uh, du in, during operating and also to, uh, to assess if we can uh, we also wanted to assess the relationship between uh, subjectively reported measures of uh, um, discomfort and pain with objective biomechanical sensor metrics. So we've done uh, prospective studies uh, colla collaborating with uh, Purdue University and Dr. Uh, Hughes' team, who's been great in this uh, collaborative work. Um, and the participants were attending surgeons. Um, these are essentially practicing surgeons who train uh, our fellows and residents who are trainees in surgery. So a variety, we observed a variety of laparoscopic and robotic operations. And uh, the reason that we have not done a lot of open procedures is because uh, my practice is mostly minimally invasive. Over 95% of the cases I do are, are such. So we have uh, uh, more access to surgeons who are doing those procedures. So we used um, um, the surgery task load, load index uh, for workload assessment. Uh, that, as you know, assesses uh, mental war, uh, demand, physical demand, temporal demand, task complexity, the degree of difficulty, situation of stress, as well as distractions. Also uh, use the musculoskeletal symptoms response uh, and the body part um, uh, discomfort scale. You can see, again, uh, the different domains or the different aspects of this uh, scale assesses the right of the screen. As mentioned, we also were interested to see what the objective um, recordings or objective measures uh, of um, uh, muscular activity as well as positioning might uh, demonstrate to us. So we used um, uh, wearable wireless uh, and non-obtrusive motion tracking sensors and pressure maps for that purpose. Um, and you can see what we placed for some of those sensors. The, uh, the picture beads that shows the pressure map uh, that um, uh, records where we put our weight during a procedure. Um, you can see the location of some of the sensors in the trapezius and deltoid uh, a a muscle areas, and as well as uh, some other positioning sensors um, like we have in the forehand and in the, in the chest. So me measures, uh, we obtain measures from IMU units, inertia measurement units, and those were reported as percent of time in a case that was spent in uh, static or demanding postures and angles. And we used also EMGs outputs that um, um, we that allowed us to measure uh, the muscle activity throughout the case. So results that uh, we did uh, have recordings and uh, um, roughly nine attendings and uh, train eleven trainees. Um, and you can see obviously attendings are older. Um, because of uh, their time in training, um, some difference also in gender distribution, um, about, but otherwise height weight was very similar, um, as well as was the glove size. So we found that attendance and neck uh, was in flexion uh, by more than 80 degrees uh, during the robotic cases compared to laparoscopic ones, uh, with a significantly higher odds ratio of eight. We also found that the uh, neck was in static position while opening the body cases as the net difference between them uh, was 8% of the total case duration. Uh, however, both uh, had similar um, times of uh, demanding uh, positions. We also found that uh, the right deltoid was contracting less than the, uh, for the laparoscopic cases, um, but they were spending uh, less time in demanding position. And similar results, uh, we identified it for the right trapezius. When we compared the attending and resident um, looking mostly at laparoscopic cases due to few robotic cases in, in these observations, we found that uh, attendings were reporting less discomfort than residents, even though they had worse ergonomic metrics. This is a fairly interesting finding that we can perhaps discuss more. Um, so. So that was um, due to the percentage of the case performed by each as this was a similar for the majority of the cases observed. Uh, and of the cases, a resident was present, 
and they perform about 60% of them while attendants perform about 70. So that's important to understand that when we do a case, uh, oftentimes the trainee does the case unless, of course, it's not up to their uh, skill level that then the attendant takes over. So the trainees uh, trunk spend less time in static uh, po uh, position than the attendings, uh, significantly less, and the residents left deltoid has less uh, mean EMG values and spend less time in demanding positions. Uh, similarly for the left trapezius, and uh, the right trapezius have more time in demanding uh, position as well. So after adjusting for confounders, um, including age, sex, uh, weight, and height, uh, the attendings and residents during the robotic cases, um, uh, when compared to the laparoscopic case, reported actually less pain. Um, and you can see that there was less uh, hand and wrist pain, shoulder and arm pain, as well as uh, on the right, as well as on the left uh, side. So um, this, again, confirms some of the uh, uh, literature that exists, but uh, generally robotic surgery provides some uh, benefits in decreasing some of the strain associated with laparoscopic surgery. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, there's also evidence that um, there's different type of uh, ergonomic injuries that uh, happen with robotic surgery, having, again, to do with the interface and how the surgeon is supposed to uh, work when they use robotic surgery. Uh, so there's some pluses and some minuses. Uh, but um, this is, uh, I think we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg as we will continue our work. But that has also led into the um, project that um, Dr. P uh, Yu will present to you as we're trying to find solutions how we can improve some of those measures. I think I will do questions at the end. So. Um, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Yu. Thank you for listening. Dr. Yu um, is um, it's, it's an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Industrial Engineering, and um, he has been done a lot of uh, ergonomic research in the areas of exposure assessment, work, and intervention design, and systems engineering with some uh, useful applications improving the safety in the healthcare uh, work environments. And, his um, title of the presentation is our second part of the, today's webinar. Is he's going to address the ergonomic, or ergonomic needs and barriers for exoskeleton implementation in the operating room. Um, Danny, I'm going to turn this over to you. So and today, um, thank you, um, Jack and Ayash, uh, for inviting me and Dr. Stephanidis um, to provide an update and some um, discussion about our work in ergonomics in the operating room. Um, Stephanie Stephanidis um, talked a lot about some of our initial work, and I'm going to talk about some of the new exciting stuff that we've been trying to start exploring, how we can start reducing some of those ergonomic risks that we see in the operating room. Um, as you can see from the, um, the title of the slide, um, the intervention that we're going to try to, um, you know, that we're going to try to explore is exoskeletons. Um, this work is a collaborative effort um, between Purdue University, um, Indiana University School of Medicine, and also Virginia Tech. Um, the co-authors on the study included um, Jackie Cha, uh, Demetrius, um, Hamid, Sarah, um, Dr. Stephanidis, and Dr. Nostal. Some quick disclosure um, on the second slide. This work is funded by uh, NIOSH, um, the, uh, the University of Michigan's NIOSH ERC um, pilot, proposed, pilot training proposal. Um, the content is solely responsible for the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services. Another quick disclosure is that the, one of the exoskeletons used in this study was loaned by the Levity Company. However, this company had no involvement in the study design, analysis, interpretation, or the decision to publish or present. Um, other exoskeletons used in studies were either purchased or loaned from another university. Um, so here uh, was the illustration, again, of um, the, what it's like, an illustration of the team in the operating room. Um, specifically, building on what Dr. Stephanidis presented um, was there's a lot of work um, in the surgery realm um, focused on the surgeon worker. And uh, Dr. Stephanidis also talked a little bit 
about um, the high prevalence of musculoskeletal pain and fatigue reported among this surgeon population. Um, however, we also want to highlight that there's also other members of the surgical team that are also exposed to ergonomic risks. Um, Dr. Stephanidis also presented some data on the surgical trainees, which includes fellows, residents, uh, medical students. Um, but there's also potentially another um, a stakeholder within the surgical team, uh, specifically the surgical nurse, which provides a lot of critical tasks like handing instruments um, to the surgeon, prepping, among other things that are also potentially exposed to musculoskeletal injuries. Um, for example, nurses do have a high report of experiencing musculoskeletal symptoms and pain. Um, focusing on surgical nurses and technicians, um, we see a lot of um, low back pain and shoulder pain being reported. And this slide another is another slide showing potential ergonomic risks, illustrating um, specifically one of the procedures that Dr. Stephanidis mentioned, our technique, um, the minim minimally evasive um, laparoscopic technique um, that is very typically characterized by these very long-handled tools. Um, what you see circled is um, some of the potential ergonomic risks um, that ergonomists see. These raised arms, um, you see that you know they are potentially stressful. But if you kind of put this in context, where the surgical procedure may last for many hours, um, these um, movements, these postures, may substantially contribute to musculoskeletal symptoms and um, fatigue. Now, despite a lot of work identifying the ergonomic risk factors um, amongst the surgical uh, in the surgical team or in the OR, there still has been very limited effective and sustained interventions. Um, there's been interventions proposed from the organizational level. Um, there's been interventions proposed from the environment and layout. Um, for example, patient positioning, um, where to put the operating room, um, the surgical monitors. There has been some reports assessed with um, uh, interventions like taking short micro breaks um, within the procedure. A lot of literature has focused on, and these are coming out every day, um, developing better instruments, better equipment, better tools for the surgeons and surgical team to use. Um, another potential intervention that was also kind of indicated from Dr. Stephanidis talk was the development of new techniques, specifically, well, what if instead of working by the patient bedside, um, we could reduce those um, risk factors, ergonomic risk factors, and perform the surgery using a robot where the surgeon is seated. Um, however, as you do see a lot of the most, uh, recent literature and systematic reviews coming out on ergonomic injuries in the OR or in the surgery, um, they're still highly prevalent. So we still need to continue exploring and improving um, options for intervening and reducing the ergonomic risks for this worker population. Um, specifically, as indicated by the title slide, um, we're very interested in seeing some of the um, potential impact on these new dynamic wearable interventions. And these interventions are what we're going to focus on are exoskeletons, specifically the passive exoskeletons, um, because the passive exoskeletons are the ones that do not require external or battery power. Here are two different types of exoskeletons, um, just to illustrate what they are. Um, there's exoskeletons for various body parts to support. Um, in the left figure, you see a back support exoskeleton. In the right figure, you see an exoskeleton designed more for upper and um, arm support. And one of the things that um, really caught our attention was that you know there has been a lot of recent application and publication um, talking about potential you know, success of exoskeletons in manufacturing workplace. And however, after talking with um, the surgical team and different healthcare providers, is that, well, we still don't know a lot about how to see whether these are effective in the healthcare environment. Um, even more, before we could even see they're effective, you know, all we have to also think about how we can really implement exoskeletons due to a lot of challenges that we see in the healthcare environment. Um, specifically, um, in contrast to a lot of the current work in manufacturing and other industries, um, healthcare may be potentially different due to very unique requirements. Um, they're very constrained um, work environments. The task demands or the task performed are very different than what we see in a lot of industries. And there's also a lot of safety um, requirements, uh, specifically for surgery. Uh, there's a high emphasis on being a sterile environment. So that's another very key um, restriction. But going back, um, 
one of the key motivations of our exploring exoskeletons was there's a lot of uh, potential um, uh, recent success being reported. Um, in assembly tasks, um, there's been success reported that exoskeletons can reduce muscle activity level. Um, there's been a study actually um, not too long ago by Liu that showed that exoskeletons can be worn by the surgeon. Um, and when worn by the surgeon, they showed that the exoskeleton can reduce shoulder self-reported shoulder pain um, by one point out of five. Um, however, we do want to note that, um, again, we don't see exoskeletons in the operating room commonly. Um, and also, there's, as presented in the background, there's multiple surgical team members, workers, um, that are also involved and also exposed to ergonomic risks. So that leads us to the two key objectives of this um, presentation. Um, the first is to prevent, present some of the work that we've done, um, qualitative work identifying potential barriers and facilitators to access qualitative implementation and translation into the operating room. The second is to present some very preliminary results of um, the impact of exoskeletons when worn by surgeons and surgical team members in the operating room. The first study um, is the one exploring barriers and facilitators, and it's recently published in the Human Factors Journal. So if you want more information and additional details, um, please um, feel free to take a look at that, um, um, that publication. Um, in this publication, um, to identify the barriers and facilities for translating exoskeletons into the healthcare environment, we conducted qualitative research with focus groups. Um, specifically, 14 um, participants participated, and they range from roles as from surgical residents, surgical nurses, um, to attending surgeons. We also had um, some of the participants perform simulated surgical tasks. Um, however, um, due to the length of the time constraints, we're not going to be presenting those results today. One of the key challenges working in this healthcare environment is participant recruitment, given their very extremely busy schedules. Um, and some of the recruitment techniques that we found successful um, was convenient sampling, cell ball sampling for surgeons and residents. Um, but for surgical nurses, um, one of the techniques that we utilized was using a hospitalized showcase event. Here you see in the images um, the lead graduate student, um, Jackie Chow. Um, performing and recruiting and uh, you know, really uh, conducting a lot of this data collection. Following standard qualitative um, research guidelines, we had a stopping criteria for participant recruitment when we reached data saturation. Uh, we included all interested participants um, over a six-month study period. Um, and as part of the participation, they provided some demographic um, data um, for us to then report. Our procedure for the focus group, um, we, due to, again, scheduling constraints um, of the participants, uh, we conducted both individual and multi-person interviews. Um, we had a moderator. And we used, based on previous qualitative work on exoskeletons, uh, we centered questions around three different bullet points. Um, we talked about, we asked the participants questions um, centered around technology adoption, um, questions about supporting how the technology, exoskeleton technology, can support workers' tasks and job, and also um, questions related to workplace safety and health. We collected audio and had it professionally transcribed, and multiple team uh, study team members coded and reviewed and performed content analysis on the coded um, transcribed transcripts. Here's some brief um, summary demographic information. Um, like I mentioned, we collected, um, we sampled for from three different roles in the operating room, the resident or assistants, um, surgical nurses, and attending surgeons. And some of the findings from the qualitative analysis was we identified four major themes um, regarding to exoskeleton adoption in the operating room. Um, these themes include characteristics of individuals, perceived benefits, environmental and societal factors, and intervention characteristics. And I'll give a little bit more detail into some examples of quotes on each of these themes in the following slides. Our first theme, characteristics of individuals. One of the representative quotes that we coded into this theme of characteristics of individuals is, I don't think that we know what we're missing potentially. 
I've done it for eight or nine years without it. And this was very representative of uh, code related to the awareness of the problem or an indicated need for an intervention. Uh, when followed up, as also similarly presented by some work um, previously published, Dr. Stephanitis, uh, or that, that was previously published, that was mentioned by Dr. Stephanitis, um, we also followed up on asking some of the current practices for reducing musculoskeletal discomfort and fatigue. And these included occupational therapy, yoga, and self-medication. On the second theme, an, ex use, an example quote um, that represents the second theme was, I think as individuals, we talk to residents about not hurting themselves. You can see when they're manipulating their bodies in all kinds of crazy ways to accomplish the task, but it's not formal training. So this is one of the quotes that we coded and associated with the theme of perceived benefits. And perceived benefits is centered around things like, OK, what are some of the evidence of long-term benefits of the technology of exoskeletons? Um, do they really in decrease musculoskeletal symptoms? And as represented by the quote is that, well, can we incorporate some of this into formal ergonomics program to make it more um, formalized? Um, as you saw in the quote, that a lot of the ergonomics training or mentioning of ergonomic benefits is really done informally. Um, passed down from either a surgeon to the trainee or amongst themselves informally. But this definitely raised the um, potential opportunity for developing a more standard ergonomics program. Another key point about perceived benefits is who can really benefit from exoskeleton implementation. We mentioned that there's different roles in the surgical team. We mentioned there's various different techniques that they perform in surgery, depending on the patient and specialty. And so one of the user roles that um, a lot of the participants, the majority of the uh, participants mentioned, was surgical assistance. Um, basically, one of the quotes here was that whoever ends up holding the scope. Um, so you can kind of imagine that holding the scope or the camera, basically. Um, when you're holding the camera, you need to keep the camera steady and in view of the tissue inside the patient in order for the surgeon to perform uh, the task needed to complete the procedure. Um, you can imagine that you know, if you're looking at a YouTube video, for example, and you see a lot of the camera movement, a lot of shaking, you're not going to be too pleased with the, with the video. Um, same thing in the operating room is that holding the scope requires very steady and that prolonged steady um, holding um, may potentially be benefited uh, from exoskeleton support of the upper arm. Another quick thing at the tail end of this quote, um, I think it will be different in each area. Um, this was just to link it back. Um, one of the key um, recommendations that we identified from this study is that adoption of exoskeletons not only would vary by role, um, they also will vary by what specialties, um, surgical specialties. There's many surgical specialties. Um, so it's very um, you know, a lot of factors to consider um, in terms of adopting, um, translating exoskeletons into the operating room. The third theme focuses on environment and societal factors. Um, specifically, a lot of these are um, focused on things like immediate results, familiarity, buy-in, safety, perception, sterilization, storage. One of the quotes that was coded and associated with media and observable results was, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to show somebody 20 years down the road this will save their back. So that really highlights the, one of the themes of you know, the ability to demonstrate there's going to be impact from the exoskeletons. Um, because if the case is made, 20 years from now, um, that potentially would not be a great facilitator for its adoption. Um, in terms of safety and sterilization, um, there were concerns about the arm cuffs. I mentioned that in the operating room, there's a huge emphasis placed on the sterile environment. Um, there's also concerns about hand bulk and surgical gown, interchanging devices. Are these going to be assigned by people per person, or is it going to be shared um, device amongst um, the team members and across different team members? And that presents some logistical factors. Finally, the fourth theme talks about intervention characteristics, um, things like maintenance, how much it costs, uh, was definitely brought up, um, and also usability. Um, some of the representative quotes here include just how long they last versus how long they take to get back up and running. So that change over time. Very hectic in the surgical environment. Um, how does adding exoskeletons will affect that? Um, another one, um, beyond just changeover, um, just 
getting ready for the procedure. Uh, I think we lost the slide a little bit. I'm going to go back down. Just getting ready for the procedure. And here's a quote um, that reflects that. If I can't get that on and get that all fitted, and fitting is a very important for exoskeleton implementation, within one minute, I don't think I can use it because you just don't have the time. So time pressure and time demands um, is definitely one of the key um, uh, potential barriers um, for the intervention um, ad uh, adoption. So a couple quick takeaways um, on, on the, how the themes inform exoskeleton adoption. Um, you know, we had suggestions on building upon that six protocol. PPP, PPE is commonly used um, in healthcare, and you know there's a lot more emphasis now in today's time. Also, um, there's also um, kind of suggestion on well, can we adapt some of these protocols that are similar, like lead dust, um, and use that um, for kind of guiding exoskeleton um, implementation and translation. Um, there's also a unique, uh, pretty interesting um, comments that showed that you know, a good strategy would be co-champions, so not just the surgeon um, leading the implementation, but co-champion um, of both nurse and surgeon. Um, again, we talked about consideration of surgical specialty and surgical team roles. So that was some of the quality of the work that we um, um, conducted. And the second part of the study is um, you know, it's really hot off the presses. Um, the students just finished analyzing the data not too long ago, so we're very excited. Um, to be able to have this preliminary results um, ready to show to demonstrate that, yes, you can have a skeleton in the operating room, and this is some potential effects that it may have in terms of the ergonomics. So to do this study, we had two conditions, um, baseline conditions and exoskeleton condition. And in these cases, we tried to randomize as much as possible, uh, depending on search, um, search uh, depending on the user's um, schedule and also the user's cases. Um, as mentioned previously, a lot of the cases were centered or focused on a general and bariatric laparoscopic cases. And we involved not just surg surgical attendants. We only had one attendant um, due to exoskeleton um, condition and baseline condition. Um, but primarily, as mentioned previously, we focused on the surgical trainee and surgical nurses um, that has not been um, and has not had a lot of interventions focused on, and also. Um, has was mentioned as one of the key roles to benefit from exoskeleton um, implementation identified by our focus groups. So in this study, um, very similar methodology. So I'm going to go through these a little bit. Uh, very similar methodology that was mentioned by Dr. Slavonidis um, in his part of the presentation. So I'll go through these a little bit more quickly. Um, we collected muscle activity level using EMG sensors. Um, we collected posture data and extracted that and estimated that from IMUs where um, kind of like accelerometer type devices that are wearable. Um, and outputs from these include posture outputs, um, percent of muscle sensitivity um, levels. And we also use statistics, um, kind of preliminary statistics. We use the Lucasin test to compare baseline and exoskeleton condition. A little bit more, after obtaining consent, <clears throat> we place the sensors on all the participants. Um, and here you can kind of see um, the exoskeleton and the sensors um, on one of the participants while performing the surgery. Um, you can already see some of the comments um, from the focus groups um, coming into play in terms of the bulk of the exoskeletons and um, how it potentially can appear with the workflow. But here are some of the preliminary results. Again, um, these are results that um, we were just able to get. Um, so some of the key things that we've seen from the results is that comparing the percent time in demanding postures. And these are based on, you know, are we seeing very high neck dorsal flexion, um, very high amounts of right and shoulder, um, left and right shoulder elevation. Um, when we see it, we don't see a lot of differences in exoskeleton's um, impact uh, in comparison to the baseline condition on posture. But we do see a significant, potentially significant um, effect where when using the exoskeleton, demanding posture um, for the right shoulder is reduced by 7%. seven and I'll uh, have an arrow here to better show where I am. Actually, it doesn't work. Um, but this is one of, uh, one of the significant findings, um, potentially, um, of the impact of exoskeletons when used compared to baseline conditions, where the right shoulder um, would be a little bit spending less time in demanding positions. We also looked into muscle activity level. And for the muscle activity level, um, 
the EMGs on the tra um, trapezius and also the deltoids. Um, looking on the left side, um, the left trapezius specifically, um, we saw two significant decreases in muscle activity level when using the exoskeleton condition. Um, for the exoskeleton condition. We divided uh, muscle activity level and normalized it across subjects by using a maximum voluntary contraction. So all the results you see in these plots are percent of the maximum voluntary contraction. Um, we saw slight decreases of, um, when using the exoskeleton condition, um, but we also um, saw that these decreases were consistent, whether it's the 10 percentile um, EMG or the 50 percentile or 90 percentile. Um, one of the potential kind of interpretations, and again, a lot of this work is preliminary, is that potentially the exoskeletons provide support that reduces the amount of muscle activity that's needed um, on the left trapezius. Finally, um, our last preliminary results for today um, that we're going to be able to present today um, is focused on the right, uh, specifically the right deltoid activation. Um, not as much, um, you know, differences um, and, uh, as, the uh, as the left side. However, um, what we do show in these graphs are significant differences in the 90 percentile contractions, um, where the one using the exoskeleton, the 90 percentile contractions um, were actually 8 percent less um, than when using the baseline condition. We also have a metric called median peak frequency, although the median peak frequency does not show significant differences. We do show that it is trending towards um, lower um, uh, medium peak frequencies when the exoskeleton conditions was observed rather than the baseline condition. So those provide some kind of preliminary work on implementing um, the exoskeletons for the surgical team members across um, multiple cases. Um, but there's a lot of limitations um, for the qualitative work. Um, during the qualitative work, participants get did get an opportunity to um, kind of experience and try the exoskeletons during the simulation task, but of, of course um, the simulation task was you know, not very representative of natural OR environment, so there's a limitation there. Um, and the implementation of the exoskeletons and the data that we presented today of the exoskeleton's effect uh, in the operating room during these live procedures. Um, again, this is very preliminary and very pilot, and we hope to continue expanding and collecting more data um, uh, of the exoskeleton's effect um, in the operating room. In conclusion, we identified the four themes um, and barriers and facilitators for exoskeleton adoption in the operating room. Um, and from our results, it seems from our ENG and posture results, um, muscle activity level and posture results, that exoskeleton can be potentially promising. Um, but we definitely need additional work and additional data to confirm some of these um, trends that we see. Quick acknowledgments. Uh, we acknowledge the staff at IU North um, and also Nurse Donna Teller for support of the, um, for the, for the studies. Uh, we would like to thank Mikkel Forsman, uh, Mickey Forsman from Karolinska, for guiding us on some of the EMG analysis. And as I mentioned in the disclosure slide, um, this work was, uh, cannot, be, um, uh, cannot occur without the support of the University of Michigan IHP. PRT program. Here's the study team. This was definitely a team effort um, and required a lot of individuals effort both from the clinical side, Dr. Stephanidis, um, Dimitri and Sarah, uh, with the engineering side, and me, the graduate student Jackie and Hamid, and also um, guidance from Dr. Nostom um, from Virginia Tech. From that, that concludes our presentation and I'll hand the, um, the control over the presentation back to Jack or Jessica to facilitate the, any Q&As and questions that me and Dr. Stephanidis can help address regarding our book to work presented today. Thank you. Thank you both so much for a great presentation. I apologize to everyone who's participating. I know we had some problems with our Q&A section at the beginning, but I think we've gotten that fixed and we have had a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first being, would you consider exoskeletons as PPE in the surgical environment? I'll give my thoughts. This is Denny. Um, I'll give my thoughts on that before um, having uh, Dr. Stephanidis, who's uh, uh, kind of the, in the clinical environment, clinical workplace, to comment. Um, but definitely as one of the themes we talked about, um, PPE is you know, very common 
widely seen and observed, and a lot of protocols exist for PPE in healthcare. Um, and that's actually one of the comments from the focus groups is that there's potential for adapting some of those protocols um, to facilitate exoskeleton implementation. Um, Dr. Stephanie, did you have any um, other insights on this question? So, uh, yes, um, and thank you for the question. Initially, I think I misunderstood it, thinking there should be a mask on the exoskeleton, but then I realized what the, the question meant. So the, um, what I would say, and also what my experience has been with the exoskeletons we used, is that um, what we currently have is not necessarily very specific to the needs of a surgeon. So if um, by perhaps carefully designing uh, surgery-specific exoskeleton, and they may vary by the procedure. So I would not look at an exoskeleton as a all-fits-all, all, so or one-fits-all, so, because that doesn't really work with surgery that much. There's different procedures that require different support at different level. Um, and we definitely saw that in, in some of the cases where we felt that uh, maybe the exoskeleton was uh, giving us too much resistance or too little. Um, so with having said that, if we could have a, a, a variety, perhaps, of, of exoskeletons that are fairly specific, as another comment has been made, if it's a very long procedure and you have a specific uh, a stature that really uh, takes toll on you, uh, an exoskeleton that alleviates some of that um, demanding uh, stature or whatever that uh, stature puts on your body, the strain you put on your body, uh, I think that would be useful. And perhaps that, that might be where um, the biggest bang for the buck might be. In other words, um, giving an exoskeleton that can support someone for a procedure they do that may last an hour, um, it won't be probably as well perceived because the surgeons, as Danny mentioned, um, uh, may not see the benefit because they may get some a strain from the procedure that in the long term may impact them, but they don't really see it immediately. But uh, contrast that to perhaps a, a procedure that lasts eight hours, that uh, definitely they know they'll, they'll be hurting at the end. And now you give them an exoskeleton that will support some of the muscle groups that uh, will be hurting them without it. And I think that will be uh, increasing significantly the buy-in. Now, over time, it could become a PPE. I just I think uh, it's going to be a little hard at this point to make it a PPE without uh, some more uh, support by the surgeons for this. I hope I answered the question. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. Are there any prospective or ongoing studies on exoskeleton use for practitioner use during extended shifts? especially in cases of pandemics and other disasters? That's a great question. This is Denny. Um, <clears throat> um, from what we've seen, we can't um, say for sure that we've seen, observed any work um, looking at exoskeletons um, over prolonged shifts um, during for clinician use. Um, currently, what we've been trying to exoskeletons, um, we're you know, collecting cases, um, individual cases, and there are multiple cases in a day. Um, however, with that's definitely something that we do plan on exploring um, as we continue in this line, so it's seeing you know, more of the long-term and continuous impact of exoskeletons um, uh, implemented in the operating room. I don't have much to add uh, to what Dr. Yu said. It's um, my previous comment, I think, addressed to some degree this. Uh, in, other, in other words, for surgery, longer procedures would probably be uh, more suited. OK, thank you. The next question and comment is, we use the Levitate airframe at Toyota, and as I understand it, it was originally developed for surgeons. However, automotive and construction industries have been most aggressive in pursuing and implementing. What would it take to move activity further and faster in this sector? This sector meaning uh, surgery, I assume. Um, so if I may 
make a comment. So it's it's like any other um, culture change process. Um, it, I do think it will require culture change, and there's a defined process that they have been described as to how to go about this. Uh, but generally, I think um, awareness would be probably one of the important steps, making people aware that how prevalent some of the ergonomic risks are, pr uh, producing the necessary evidence that you know you're at risk to have this happen to you. But if you use this uh, instrument or, or um, exoskeleton or whatever it is, you will decrease that risk by this much. I think once uh, that evidence exists, and we can currently correct, collecting some of that, it's just that I don't know that we have plenty of evidence to demonstrate uh, the point, and um, also making uh, the equipment uh, as unobtrusive as possible, uh, then um, um, that, because the biggest risk, obviously, of using an exoskeleton in the OR is to interfere with the surgeon doing the procedure, which can have uh, poor consequences for patient care. So, and that's the biggest, uh, that's why unobtrusiveness, uh, which by design, I guess, it would be somewhat obtrusive, but uh, f finding that uh, balance between helping but not really interfering with what the surgeon is doing, that's the tricky part. And if that can be achieved and we can generate available evidence, I do see that uh, um, being used more in surgery. And just to briefly add to that, um, and you know, this is an excellent comment on really how everything you know really comes around. Um, with uh, one of the exoskeletons initially potentially designed for surgical use, and then really have that ad um, adoption really pick up in other industries, and now we're coming back to it. Um, and I just really want to add that you know the as we showed in our first study, um, there's a lot of variables that are very specific to healthcare. Um, that really makes it uh, very a, a challenge and uh, to really facilitate this adoption. Um, we talked about a lot of different concerns, a lot of different barriers. Um, and we also talked about that, as uh, Dr. Stefan um, Stephanie has mentioned, that you know this also depends on the procedures. So it's not one of the you know drop um, drop it um, in the beginning of the day and then uh, you know, let it, um, you know, let people use it throughout the day. It depends on what type of procedures, what type of role they're performing. Um, so that complexity really is a challenge that we're trying to explore. Um, and um, we actually have those raw focus group transcript data um, set available, and that can be found um, within the link of the paper. So um, there's a lot of other comments that the um, participants provided that we weren't able to present and um, talk about, um, but they also present uh, provide a lot of good data on some of the unique um, insights that they provided in terms of getting exoskeletons adopted in the healthcare um, space. But the most primary thing that we're working on right now is, like Dr. Stefan has mentioned, is really generating that evidence. Um, several of the themes were actually quite had some overlap in that they focused on what is the evidence of how would this really help me? Can I see how this helped me? Um, and that's kind of where we're going in some initial um, studies and a lot of initial studies across industries is you know, using um, various um, tools, what is the impact of exoskeletons on um, exoskeletal health? Um, and that's an ongoing work. And as we build evidence, um, we have a lot of um, potential opportunities in sharing this evidence um, and really seeing how this translates into this healthcare type, um, healthcare type work. So excellent question. Great. We just have a few more minutes left, so I'm going to ask uh, two more questions, and I apologize to the participants if we didn't get to your question. Um, the first one is, can you discuss a little more about how you addressed sterilization concerns, and also how were those who did the fitting of the exoskeletons on the subject trained? So I'll address the first one. We put um, um, the exoskeleton under the surgical gown. So in other words, we put on the exoskeleton first and then put on the gown, and that uh, took care of the sterilization concerns. Um, Dr. Yu, you want to take the second one? Yeah, so the second question was talk, um, was a question about uh, the fitting. And um, like I mentioned, one of the um, comments was that we received was the fitting was, um, you know, they have to be able to get um, the 
the hexagons on and off quickly, and also uh, there's a heavy importance on getting and ensuring that the exoskeletons are making the appropriate impact or you know being performed as uh, they're intended to be um, to do. And to answer that question, um, the study team members that were um, applying the exoskeletons or helping the um, participants wear the exoskeletons, um, they were trained and certified um, by the manufacturer. Um, the exoskeletons uh, we used in this one was the upper arm support, um, and uh, they had um, they graciously had uh, somebody um, visit on site several times to certify our surgical team members in the appropriate giving um, for the specific exoskeleton. And yeah. I can briefly say one comment for the for the last two questions, perhaps, so they don't feel that we didn't address them. Uh, so one suggestion is whether we should uh, support the forearm, and I, I agree that that's why I said I made the comment that um, we need to see what uh, is most needed um, for the exoskeleton for that particular case, and, and I think uh, the comment is appropriate about perhaps supporting the forearm. I don't know if that would work better, but it's something we need to investigate. And whether there's been any cycle time observations um, to identify ways. There's been a number of studies. I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever be able to to reduce completely the waste, but um, um, it's clearly an area that needs more attention. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Uh, Stephanidis and uh, Dr. Yu, for your wonderful presentation.